Hello and welcome along to Al's Geek Lab. In this episode, we're going to look into the original PC architecture. Firstly, a wee bit of the background. We're going to go down memory lane and figure out all of the decisions that were made to get to where the IBM PC was launched back in 1981. But we're also going to ask the question, why did IBM choose the 8088 processor? It was controversial, certainly. It was underpowered. Indeed, it could only address one megabyte of memory, which is probably one of its biggest limitations. So why did they choose this when other contemporary processors out there could have been a better choice? Stay tuned, the answers will become clear. The story that led to IBM making the choices in the design of the personal computer are deep-rooted in IBM's history. The PC marked a huge shift in the way the firm operated. So it's worthwhile getting to know a bit of the background on just who IBM were before they made the personal computer. Incorporated in 1911, IBM pioneered computer technology. In the 1960s, they brought about the System 360, a revolution in mainframe computing. With only a handful of competitors, such as Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, and HP, by the 1960s, IBM were almost unstoppable, their big blue banner emblazoned across terminals everywhere. IBM were a household name, especially visible by 1969, when they were publicly seen as a major contributor underpinning the computer technology of the Apollo space program with NASA. By the 1980s, IBM represented over 60% of the global mainframe computer market. In addition to their computer equipment, they introduced many other firsts, including the Selectric Typewriter, Floppy Disk, the first practical hard drives, and many other firsts. The first that they really missed out on, though, was the personal computer. IBM was making a killing on mainframes and many computers that were computers the size of a cabinet or two, as opposed to a full room. They thought that computers at home would remain a hobbyist domain IBM believed that at work, people would continue to use the larger systems as a central computing point, using remote terminals on office desks that would communicate with the mainframes rather than standalone computers. They were wrong. By June of 1977, a fledgling company based in a garage in California called Apple Computer had just come out with the 8-bit Apple II personal computer. It sported color graphics, sound, eight expansion slots, a proper keyboard, and was an instant success at an affordable price. It revolutionized the market overnight. Competing in the market very shortly after was the Tandy Radio Shack TRS-80 computer, the Commodore PET, and then later the Texas Instruments 99, Atari 400 and 800, as well as the Sinclair ZX-80, and many other ones. By the time that IBM got round to thinking about a personal computer, the market was already thriving, worth at least $150 million in 1979, and expected to grow by 40% in the early 1980s. IBM were clearly on the back foot. They needed to play catch up, fast. Before the rise of the microcomputer, IBM was known as the safe bet in computing. A well-known phrase, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM, is the thing of legend. Because there was a growing market in home and office microcomputers, and IBM weren't present in this sector, businesses were left scratching their heads. They were buying from companies such as Commodore and Apple instead of the safe bet. IBM were not happy. Not only did IBM not see the microcomputer revolution happening, when they finally cottoned on, some key staff at IBM knew that the wheels of inertia were so slow that developing a system that could compete in the microcomputer market would mean that the market could pass them by altogether. The truth was, IBM were embroiled in red tape and management hierarchy, as well as a solid research and development process. IBM were the epitome of proprietary. They would develop everything themselves in their own labs, processors, memory, motherboard design, None of it was off-the-shelf components. All of this was great for quality control and solid products, but really bad when it came to developing a new product quickly. 
IBM didn't have the agility of companies like Apple that could create a computer with a couple of guys in a garage in a matter of months. In fact, when asked for an estimate on how long it would take IBM's engineers to develop a microcomputer using IBM's standard processes, their engineers said it would take them four years to produce a product. The year was 1980. There had been at least three to four years steady growth in the microcomputer market, which IBM wasn't in at all. An IBM executive by the name of Bill Lowe was one of the staff at IBM who foresaw the rise of the microcomputer. In fact, he had started working on trying to sell personal computers to IBM as far back as 1973. By the time 1980 rolled along, Bill tirelessly tried to convince senior staff that in order to enter the microcomputer market, IBM would have to radically change the way they work if they were going to get a product out in time. Finally, in September of 1980, the chairman Frank Carey and then CEO John Opel agreed to make a skunk works division of sorts to rapidly develop a personal microcomputer. Despite IBM employing over 340,000 staff in 1980, Bill was given a team of just 12 staff to develop the personal computer, or simply PC as it became known in time. So the skunk works began in earnest. One of the early options was to acquire Atari and base their new machine on the Atari 800 computer. The 800 shipped in late 1979 and used the MOS Technologies 6502 processor, an 8-bit CPU. Acquiring an outside company such as Atari was a move that was practically unheard of in IBM history. It was hardly a surprise then that IBM executives rejected the idea. Given that an acquisition was not an option, Bill took his team to task. They saw that the best way to bring a decent microcomputer to the market was to use mainly off-the-shelf components and design the machine with an open architecture. This was very much against the design philosophy of IBM, but it was clear that if they were going to get to market in time, research, design and creation of their own system using proprietary IBM hardware was simply not going to work. When IBM's executives agreed that Bill's plan was solid, in time they allowed up to 150 engineers to join the team of 12. They had just 12 months to get it shipped. The open architecture allowed the PC to connect to peripherals and expansion cards made by third parties to the machine. IBM knew that they wouldn't have enough IBM branded peripherals ready on day one. They were also following in the footsteps of Apple. The Apple II's eight expansion slots were a big part of the reason that the Apple II was so successful. Many of Bill's team were also Apple II owners at the time and were quick to raise this advantage with the team. Bill's team figured correctly that the industry would create many more expansion offerings that greatly increased the usefulness of the PC. Before 1981 was out, a booming cottage industry had already started making all sorts of add-on cards, such as speech synthesis cards, mouse interfaces, Z80 daughter boards, RAM cards, disc controllers, graphics cards, you name it. These add-ons were coming out thick and fast. When the PC shipped, IBM received no patents on the PC. This is important. This was due to the fact that 90% of the PC had been manufactured by third parties. Indeed, the only major proprietary part to the PC was its ROM BIOS. Without this early decision to make the architecture open, who knows if the PC would have had the success it did. As a side note, years later, with the release of the PS2 systems, IBM tried to undo the open architecture of the PC and make a new proprietary expansion bus called MCA, or Micro Channel Architecture, forcing any third parties to pay a license fee to IBM if they wanted to make expansion cards. In the end, MCA failed, opening the way for companies such as Compaq and Dell to make clones of the IBM PC using an extended 16-bit version of the PC's original open expansion architecture. Amongst the many decisions on what to choose for the new computer architecture, the most major would define how the rest of the PC would work. This, of course, is the CPU, the brains of the machine, 
The explosion of the integrated circuit and computer on a chip solutions had been threatening the mini computer and mainframe markets long before IBM got into the market. So by the time that IBM came to choose a processor for the PC, there were quite a few options to choose from. Indeed, there were a proliferation of 8-bit processors as well as even 16-bit and some 32-bit processors available. The first 32-bit processors came out in 1980 and 1981, one of which was a 10 MHz IBM processor called ROMP, a sophisticated reduced instruction set or RISC CPU running at 10 MHz. In true IBM style, despite the CPU being readied in 1981, the first computer that actually shipped with the ROMP was in 1986, the RTPC. Had the original 1981 PC shipped with this processor, the PC would have been massively ahead of its time, opening up the possibility for multitasking and real-time operations that were only seen in the likes of higher-end mini-computers of the time. Alas, this wasn't to be. Bill Lowe's team had a few credible options for processors at the time. With 24-bit and 32-bit processors being a bit far-fledged, it came down to good old 8-bit processors or the more powerful 16-bit processors. Processors either came with the CISC, Complex Instruction Set, or RISC, Reduced Instruction Set. There are pros and cons of each design that waged wars for many years, with Apple and others, including IBM at times, sitting in the RISC side of the argument. The credible 8-bit processors of the time were MOS Technology 6502 and its follow-up, the 6502C. It was first introduced in 1975. It ran at 1 MHz and was featured in many original microcomputers such as the Apple II, Commodore PET, BBC Micro, Atari 800, Commodore VIC-20 and even the Atari 2600 console, well, a variant thereof. Effectively, it was a RISC-based processor. Although it ran at 1 MHz, it would often appear competitive in speed with other contemporary CPUs. Thus was enormous success for many years into the 1980s, and although simple in design, it had many fans and later followed up with a 16-bit descendant called the 65C816 in 1983. It was most notably used for the Apple II GS range of computers at that point in time. As with most processors, the 6502 could address up to 64K of RAM. There was also the Z80 CPU, it was a product of another 12 employee size company, made up of people who left Intel. The Z80 was Zilog's first product, it launched in 1976 and was also a massive success. It made it into machines such as the Sinclair Z80 and Z81, as well as the Spectrum later in 1982. In the office, it was used in more serious machines such as the K-Pro, Osborne 1 and the Epson QX10 computers. Its low heat output made it successful in the portable, embedded and handheld computers industry and is still being used today in many consumer electronic systems. Interestingly, it is a software compatible extension of the Intel 8080 CPU. The Z80 originally came in at 2.5 MHz and later a revision ran at 4 MHz with later generations even running at 6, 8 and 10 MHz. The CPU could support up to 64K of RAM. Other possible contenders could have included the quasi 16-bit Motorola 6809 which was used on the TRS-80 color computer and the Vectrix as well as the 8-bit 8085 from Intel. More on that one in a minute though. However, fairly early on in the development of the PC, the Dirty Dozen, as they'd become known, decided that the fully 8-bit processors wouldn't cut it. The team had the foresight to say that having a maximum of 64K RAM was a limitation that wouldn't be best suited for business applications of the future. The Commodore 64 came out a year after the IBM PC did, and it had a 64K RAM limit. So this was not a limitation that other manufacturers felt was so important, and many other machines came after that that also sported 8-bit processors with 128K RAM. However, they had to make use of the difficult bank switching memory operations techniques. The IBM team decided that the PC should support even higher memory capacities than the 8-bit processors could. So from day one, the PC shipped with options to house 256K RAM and in time expansion boards would take it to 640K without any other system modifications. <laughs> 
So after the 8-bit processors had been ruled out, that just left 16-bit processors. Firstly, the Texas Instruments TMS9900, a 16-bit single-chip version of the TI-990 mini-computer or the DEC PDP-8. Despite it being 16-bit, it could only address up to 64K of RAM. It was used in the TI-99-4 home computers. Texas Instruments' Walden C. Rhymes gave a presentation to IBM's team that were developing the PC at the time. According to Rhymes, TI lost out on the opportunity because IBM had already received production samples of the Intel 8086, which were going through quality assurance at the time. In the mid-1970s, Texas Instruments were the largest semiconductor company. Despite this, after a few more attempts at making computers, Texas Instruments stopped work on general purpose microprocessors shortly after. Next up was the Motorola MC68000, released in 1979, known as the 68K. It was designed from the ground up with the CISC instruction set, without backward compatibility for their previous 8-bit 6800 range computers. Initial speeds of the processor were zippy, available at 4, 6 and 8 MHz, with 10 MHz, 12.5 MHz and even a 16.7 MHz version being produced through to the early or late, late 1980s. They were instant favourites for Unix workstations and favourited by companies such as Sun Microsystems. Despite it being a 16-bit processor, it had a 32-bit instruction set and a data bus and a 24-bit non-segmented memory address bus, making it ideal for programming. It supported up to 16 megabytes of physical memory, the memory capacity eclipsed that of contemporary CPUs by quite some amount. And just to be clear here, the Intel processors that were available at the time supported a maximum of 1 megabyte RAM. The 68K was hugely popular in computers that arrived in the mid to late 80s, including the Apple Macintosh, the Commodore Amiga, the Atari ST and many others. It outperformed the Intel equivalents at the time easily. It's still in use in many systems today, 41 years after its first production run. That leaves the Intel 8086. I've already touched on the fact that Texas Instruments were rebuked by IBM because they were already trialing the 8086. However, in the end, IBM chose not to use the 8086 either. Released in 1978, the 8086 was a true 16-bit processor, initially running at 5 MHz. The 8086 was the first in the line of the long-standing x86 processors, with the 80286, 386 and 486 line continuing the trend. The CPU had a 20-bit address bus which allowed support for up to 1 MB addressable RAM. Unlike the non-segmented memory bus of Motorola's 68K, the 8086 allowed a maximum linear address space of 64K, meaning that despite supporting 1 MB of RAM, you had to write code to using segment registers, making programming the CPU a little bit more cumbersome. It was not until the advent of 1985's 80386 CPU, a true 32-bit microprocessor, was this design constraint resolved. Despite it running at 5 MHz, the CPU had to wait 4 clock memory access cycles, making it slower than contemporary CPUs for 8-bit data transfers, but slightly faster for 16-bit transfers. There were also some other technical limitations, such as a slow instruction fetch in execution units, which hindered performance a little as well. This is true even with today's Intel and AMD x86 processors. Later variants of the x86 introduced in 1980 supported speeds of up to 10 MHz. Finally, we get to the CPU that came in the IBM PC. Around a year after Intel released the 8086, they came out with the 8088 or 8088 as some know it. It was a variant of the 8086. The 88 was architecturally very similar to the 8086. The main difference is that the 8086 is a true 16-bit processor, the 8088 is not. Internally, the 8088 is a 16-bit processor, but the 8088 has an 8-bit data bus. Whereas the 8086 can read and write 8 or 16-bit data at a time, the 8088 
can only do 8-bit da data transactions at a time. The clock speeds of the 8086 were 5, 8 and 10 MHz, whereas the 8088 came in at only 4.77 and 8 MHz variants, although later clones like the NEC V20 CPU supported up to 10 MHz. Performance-wise, the 8088 could run about half of the speed of the 8086, and the only benefit of the 8088 over the 8086 is that it was fully backwards compatible with the older 8085 processor. Whether this was of any real benefit to most everyday PC users is arguable, but it might have made more sense at the time due to the prevalence of the CPM operating system, which was intended to ship with the IBM PC rather than MS-DOS. CPM was typically seen on Z80 processor based machines at the time, and the 8085 was a better performing version of the 8080 processor from 1974. The 8080 was the genesis of the Z80 processor, and was indeed mostly compatible with the Z80, which allowed for much of the Z80 software to run on the 8088 without significant changes. So, if the Intel 8086 and the Motorola 68K were clearly better chips than the 8088, why in the heck did IBM choose the 8088? Some may argue that it's all down to one or two reasons, but I've checked and I can find up to five different reasons why they chose the 8088. The first one is simple, cost. The list prices of the initial 5 MHz variant of the 8086 on release was slightly cheaper than the 8088, $87 versus $125. This was strange because both chips featured exactly the same amount of transistors. However, when IBM went to buy a CPU from Intel, they were offered the 8088 at a cheaper unit price than the 8086. Instead of going down in price, the 8086's newer and faster variants went up in price. This is unusual with regards to CPU pricing following Moore's law. Don't sue me please, but something here sounded a bit fishy. So yes, at the time that IBM got the 8088, the processor was cheaper than the 8086. But looking a, a bit further afield, choosing the Motorola MC68000 on a purely cost basis it was clear that Intel won out in that area. The 68K was priced at approximately $350 more than the 8088. Off-the-shelf memory chips were 8 bits at the time. So to use a 16-bit CPU and access memory efficiently, i.e. 16 bits at a time, you'd have to use twice as many memory chips. And memory chips were expensive. So that would add up to $400 more to the price. So you can see that both the cost of the CPU and the memory would have made the PC untenable compared to other contemporaries. The second reason why the 8088 was chosen is that Intel claimed that availability of the 8088 was better than the 8086. At the time of production in 1980, Intel were able to supply more 8088 chips. It is quite probable given that both the 8088 and the 8086 had 20 nanometer fabrications, they were made at the same factory. Who knows? Also, who knows if Intel had in fact made too many 8088s and we weren't selling, so they decided to make IBM an offer that was too good to refuse. Again, pure conjecture. The third reason is go with what you know, or research and development time. The personal computers of 1980 were almost all still 8-bit machines. If IBM were to make a 16-bit bus, it would require researching a whole motherboard design, rather than something which was familiar at the time. Not only would the motherboard have to be quite different from the 8-bit machines, they would have to design new expansion slot types that wouldn't necessarily use off-the-shelf components. In the end, the 8-bit expansion ports that were used on the IBM PC were incredibly similar to those on the Apple II. The Motorola 68K chip was also not completely proven. It had only just come to market. The chip wasn't fully debugged or proven as a safe bet by appearing in other personal computers. IBM would be pioneering by using this chip, 
and as we know by now, Big Blue were known for being conservative when it came to risk. It was clear that if IBM wanted to use the 8086 or the 68K, they would have to spend some time in research and development compared to having an 8-bit bus. Schematics for 8-bit machines were widely available with designs by third parties in the public domain. This meant that IBM didn't have to do very much to make an 8-bit bus motherboard. So looking at it with a pure project management hat on, time to research a 16-bit architecture costs money. And on top of that, every moment that IBM didn't release the personal computer was time that the rest of the market could take market share away from IBM. The cost of delay was doubly high. One of the engineers who joined the PC team, David Bradley, had just finished work on a machine that was finished around August 1980. Known as the Data Master or IBM System 23, it was a small all-in-one computer. It ran IBM's own basic language. The idea was it was easy enough for anyone to install in their own office. Although this was a totally different system and it was part of IBM's long time to release legacy, work started on it four years before it was released, it was in fact a desktop sized personal computer. In fact, this was one of two machines released by IBM that were effectively personal computers, both of which came out before the PC. Both of them flopped, mainly due to price. Interestingly though, in a case of the Data Master, IBM had chosen to use Intel's 8085 processor. As mentioned earlier, the 8088 processor had backward compatibility with the 8085 or Z80 CPUs. This meant that design principles used on the Data Master could be reused in some cases on the PC. When David Bradley finished work on the Data Master team, he said that him and his team had now become intimately familiar with the Intel architecture and support chips. Lessons learned from the Data Master also included the fact that designing their own basic language was a very slow process. David knew that using an existing basic would speed up this process. This is the main reason that Microsoft's BASIC was embedded into the ROM of every PC and XT. The Data Master included the keyboard, monitor and system unit in one box. The team learned that having the keyboard attached to the chassis of the PC wasn't going to be a good move. However, they did reuse the exact same keyboard, which became known as the Model F. The fourth reason that IBM chose the 8088 was perhaps because of outside influence. In a copy of InfoWorld magazine from August 1982, Bill Gates was quoted that, there was a lot of input into the design of the IBM PC from people at Microsoft. This input was made even before IBM greenlighted the development of the PC. Gates went on to say that Microsoft made influential statements about not using the Z80 CPU. There was some consideration of having it be a Z80 processor. One of the key engineers and I held out breath and said, look, it's got to be a 16-bit processor. The article then states, many people wondered why the IBM selected the 8088 processor rather than the 8086, which would have been a more powerful selection. To which Bill Gates is quoted as chuckling, that was complicated. Looking back, I have to say that in retrospect, it was a close call. I sure know a lot of cases where it would be nice to have additional machine horsepower. The article goes on to say that had IBM chosen an 8-bit processor, scheduling of the machine would have been easier because a vast amount of Z80 software was already available at the time. Now, I'm not suggesting here that Bill Gates deliberately sabotaged the use of the Z80 processor in the PC so that he could use an Intel compatible operating system, which would become MS-DOS. But the obvious choice for an operating system at the time was Digital Research's CPM operating system. Indeed, this was actually IBM's first choice, rather than Microsoft's DOS. Asked later, IBM were tight-lipped about Microsoft's involvement, simply saying that they went to Microsoft because of their basic interpreter. It was very good and widely used. IBM's spokesman, John Twiddell, said, IBM designed the PC, 
Microsoft looked at the design and said that IBM had a quote, nice machine. The fifth and final item on the list is about software. Apparently, there had to be software applications and more importantly, an operating system that was available for the processor. Seattle Computer Products had an operating system known as 86DOS, or QDOS as it was first known. QDOS, interestingly, stood for Quick and Dirty Operating System. Microsoft bought QDOS from SCP for $75,000 and in turn they licensed it to IBM who rapidly needed an operating system that would work with an 8086 or an 8088. Digital Research's CPM86 operating system just wasn't released in time. Whether it was cost to produce, availability, research and development time, outside influences, software or a combination of all of the five, the choice to put that Fiat engine in a potential Ferrari was cemented sometime in 1980. Whether it was the right choice or whether it could have been pushed a little more is something that we'll never know. But what we do know is that later PC clones such as the Amstrad PC1512 shipped with the 8086 instead of the 88 and performed favourably over the other IBM equivalents. All the choices had been made and by the autumn of 1981 the first PC arrived, the 5150. The very first computers seemed as big as houses and so mysterious that for most of us the computer was behind a closed door. But IBM was thinking how to make the computer more useful and as one good idea led to another, it began getting smaller, faster, less expensive and easier to use. Today, a new IBM computer has reached a personal scale. A person can afford it. A person can put it anywhere, office, home, or school. And a person can learn to use it with ease. IBM made its personal computer to help a person be more productive, to help a person be more creative. And those are good reasons for a person to feel good. The IBM Personal Computer, now at selected stores across the country. The base model was equipped with 16K of RAM with that 4.77 MHz 8088 processor, a cassette interface, no monitor, having a TV interface instead. The base model without any extras would cost you 1,565 US dollars. In 2020's money, that equates to around $5,100. Considering that other systems such as the Apple II were selling for less than $1,300 and a TRS-80 cost just $599 including a monitor, if you wanted a half decent IBM PC, you could upgrade to 64K of RAM, a floppy disk drive and a monitor which would set you back $3,000 or approximately 9,800 in today's money. The PC wasn't the cheapest system out there by any means, but it did have one big advantage though, the sticker on the front saying IBM. By the end of 1982, an IBM PC was sold every minute of every business day. So to conclude, today's PCs are still effectively the same as that 1981 system. They still use the same Intel type architecture and can still even run the same software if pushed to do so. Despite Apple's resurgence around the mid 2000s and the conversion to using Intel based processors, they still only hold a market share of 6.3%. IBM sold their personal computer division to Lenovo on the 1st of May 2005. IBM's CEO at the time, Samuel Palmisano, stated that the company wasn't the standard setting organization that it had been. Whilst the personal computer division was still profitable at the time, Palmisano didn't see the PC as innovative or a long term growth market. Despite many people agreeing that the PC market would slowly decline to nothing in the face of new technology, including tablets, mobile phones and other on demand consumption methods. This hasn't quite happened as people expected. Indeed, in 2019, IDC and Gartner concluded 
that the PC market actually grew 4.7% and has been growing steadily since its low point in the last decade. And with over quarter of the market's sales, guess which company is top of the roost in the PC market? Yep, you guessed it, it's Lenovo. Despite its relatively high cost, its questionable design choices, and its no frills style, the IBM PC created an industry standard that long outgrew IBM. In my opinion, the lower powered 8088 CPU was a poor choice that defined a legacy of setbacks and compromises that lasted into the 90s, fixed by the 80386. However, unless you are watching this video on a phone or a tablet, you are watching on a descendant of the 8088. Despite the poor choice of CPU, the PC endured because of many other aspects. The IBM badge, the open architecture and documentation, its expandability, and the killer applications like Lotus 123 to name but a few. One can only wonder how the world will look today if the PC wasn't the platform that won out. We'd almost definitely not be using Microsoft Windows as it is today, maybe not even using Microsoft products at all. Apple, Commodore or Atari logos might even adorn every desktop and perhaps a more proprietary existence might have taken shape. For me though, I'm glad that the IBM compatible PC won the computer wars of the 80s. It unified the computer landscape of the 80s and early 90s and created an open industry standard that we have come to take for granted to this very day. Thanks very much for watching. If you liked this episode and want to see more, please subscribe below. If you've got any comments, I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, take care and have a great day.